Hello and welcome to First Street Church. We exist to help everyone experience Jesus and live the abundant life. I am Ryan. And I am Joe. We are the co-senior pastors to First Street Church because it takes two of us to do the job of one human being. One very simple job. Yep. That's it. What you you're going to find. What one job? One job. We split preaching 50-50, so I don't know which one of the two of us you're going to get in a minute. But like we always say, you're either going to like it, you're going to hate it, but it's 50-50. This 13-hour sermon is going to be the best part of your day. We're excited for you to check it out. Well, that's 13 hours if you preach. Yes. It's 15 if I preach. It's typically 15 minutes if I preach, but it feels like 13 hours. That's a good point. But if you'd like to say, hey, oh, man, that's really cool. Where can I get more of these guys? I'd like more searching on YouTube. You've got to check out You Won't Hate It podcast. It is a newer podcast that I absolutely love, mainly because we're in it. Yeah, and to deadbeats. We, we drag two guys off the street, uh, our executive pastor and our worship pastor, and they join us. And it's looking at life through the lens of pastors at the length of a cigar. Yes. Okay. So don't be afraid. There will be a cigar. So or four of them. And if you're like, wow, I like your podcast and I like these sermons, where can I get even more? You can go to First Street Church Facebook page and join us live on Sundays at 10, 15 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. And it is an interactive service, so you'll be able to comment and interact with us while we're on stage. A lot of fun. And even though you're watching this after a Sunday morning, feel free to leave comments. We will interact with you on those. Also, we love to hang out and just chat through what we're talking about. And the best version of this, we're saying this, you don't have to. This is not a have to. But the best version of this, honestly, is to show up on a Sunday morning. We would love to hang out. You can pull us aside and say, hey, we watched one of your terrible sermons on YouTube, and we just wanted to meet you and make fun of you to your face. We would accept that 100%. But anyways, either way, enjoy this 17-hour sermon. Okay, how about a sermon? Let's do that. Let's Let's do that. Let's do that. Let's continue in John, uh, and we're... We're continuing the story of Lazarus. He has died. And um, so we're going to continue looking at that. Right? I don't know that, why that, that was so funny. That was great. It was a great He's dead. No, I wanted to say Jeez. it. Like, I'm like, this is a lot of fun. Lazarus is dead. <laughs> so let's go. Uh, so we're at this. Jesus has finally arrived uh, on the scene. But before we get to that, um, when I was processing this whole sermon, this whole passage here in John 11, and we're going to be in 17 through 37, those who want to get your Bibles ready for that, I was really taken by one particular part. There's, there's a lot of buildup, but then really when I was looking at how Jesus observed the crowd, and Jesus obviously weeps, this is the, the part in the Bible where it says Jesus wept, the shortest verse in scripture. Um, it's weird is I had one thought when he cried. Emotions are good. Emotions are good. I don't know what happened in our life, our world, specifically in Christianity, where we want to use truth to suppress emotions. Like it's everything's always about cowboy up, right? Because there are things out there that are true, as opposed to they can work together. Emotions are good. You can be die hard committed to the truth with tears streaming down your face as you march forward in what you're supposed to do. Emotions are good. And so I want to talk a little bit about that. And as I was thinking through this idea of emotions are good, uh, I was just thinking about my relationship with my mom. So I'm the youngest of 10 kids, and uh, I'm the baby. Uh, I'm 50. Uh, I know I, I look much older. Uh, but I'm 50 years old, and when I go back to Chicago, so my family nickname is Butch, and when I go back to Chicago, I'm Butchy, and when we go back, it's typically for the holidays, like it's Christmas or something like that, and I have seven sisters or, who are older than me and two brothers, and my seven sisters treat me like the baby. So when I go there and it's Christmas dinner, they're like, oh, do you want a plate? Do you hungry, Butchy? <laughs> Should I make you a plate? And I'm like, yes, please. <laughs> I'm definitely hungry. I'm so, I'm so hungry. And so they treat me like a baby, and I love it. I love every bit of it. I'm always like, baby, hungry. I'm, I just walk around passive aggressive, like, what should I do? I'm so hungry. You know, they're always, my dream version of myself is 500 pounds. It's just, it's just the baby just getting food, like, oh, and eating as much of the food and being taken care of and all that stuff. So they still treat me that way. When they see me, it's Butchie. Butchie's here. You hungry, Butchie? I don't know why it's always hungry. It's just an Italian thing, I think. 
I'm like, I'd like a car. No, I'll make you a plate of food. I'm like, okay. So I'm the, I'm the baby. Here's the funny part. Ryan's the baby in the Panair family. And Ryan likes to let people believe that, like, if you talk to Ryan, he acts like a firstborn. Totally. But then once you get yeah. around him, you realize Ryan's definitely the baby. Yeah. Yeah. He's definitely the baby. Christina yeah. treats him like the baby. 100%. He is 100% yeah, yeah, yeah. the baby. Nan treats him like the baby. He's the yeah. baby. And so it's always funny. I was just like, I was like, I was writing this. And I'm like, oh, man, I'm such a baby. I'm like, wait a second. Ryan's the baby, too. He's just hiding it from everybody. Just more mature. They're not, mm. In public. In public, <laughs> yes. <laughs> How about less pathetic in public? I, I just full on baby all the time. Help me out. Uh, so, so Ryan's also the baby. Uh, and so, anyway, so I'm, I'm the baby of the family, and my mom absolutely treated me like the baby. I, at, at number 10, I did no chores. And there were chores to be done when you have 10 kids. I did no dishes. I did no cleaning. I did nothing. Literally, my, everybody else did everything, even the, oh, the other boys. It wasn't because I was a boy. It was just because I was the baby. And so my mom and I had a very special relationship. Uh, she was this tiny, little, fiery woman. She was about 4'11", 98 pounds. She, and she was a firecracker, cussed like a sailor, hit like a boxer. I mean, she was just tough, <laughs> tough, tough. Uh, but also, just she was that hard exterior because she was wrangling cats with 10 kids. You know, she's like, ah, you know, keeping everybody together. But then she was just so sweet and soft hearted. And I just really, I mean, I was probably hard to picture this, but I'm a total mama's boy. I mean, I'm at, okay, not hard to picture at all. I totally project mama's boy. And I absolutely loved her. I remember one time when I got caught stealing, and my dad, this was the, this was the, like serious spanking. Like this is the big deal. This is bare butt belt, you know, getting it out across the butt. And I remember my mom taking me to the executioner like she was getting executed. <laughs> and like, and she was, she was a disciplinarian. But I remember being like, it's gonna be okay, baby. It's gonna be okay. You know, just <laughs> takes me into the room. I get spanked to come out. She hugged me and kissed me and we both cried. By the way, don't ever do that. That's some stupid stuff. I love discipline. I love punishment. My dad definitely crossed the line. So if anybody here is whipping their kids bare ass with a belt, you're wrong. I'm just gonna tell you right now. There's no version that that's needed. I don't know what's happening. I actually thought about it. Man, if I do that, I would, I would never do that to my kid. And I'm, I'm a super disciplinarian. So anyway, I can tell my wife, my, my therapist wife's looking at me like, you're not gonna celebrate that, are you? You feel it, just like, argh, argh. no. I get it now that it's wrong. <laughs> Took a long time. Uh, but anyways, I'm all for punishment, though. Okay, consequences, just within reason. He, I was, Corporal. I was 10. I was 10. I don't really know if you need to get whipped with a belt when you're 10. So I'm just saying. Uh, okay, uh, so anyway, so my mom's upset. She's crying. Uh, and she... You know, she absolutely had a total special relationship. Uh, you know, I, they, my siblings still tell this story that I come home one day from school. You know, I come in, I'm like, Mom? Mom? And my one sister's like, she abandoned us. Mom! <laughs> and my mom comes in, what the F are you screaming about? I'm right here. But it all it took was just a tiny little poke <laughs> that my mom isn't around and I lose my mind. And so this is my relation with my mom, uh, and just super tight, super close. Uh, in eighth grade, my mom gets cancer, and she is diagnosed with six months to live. Almost immediately, she is put into hospice, and she's in our living room. Uh, she's only 45 years old, 46 years old, and she's in the living room, and uh, I'm just slowly watching my mom die as a boy. And eventually it got so bad that she had to be taken to the hospital and just be cared for there. And uh, I never went to see her. I didn't think she was going to die. I didn't think I was giving up time with the woman I loved the most in my life. And I never went to see her. One day, while I'm living my eighth grade life, my best eighth grade life, 
There is a knock on the Hogwarts-style closet that I le- lived in that was called my bedroom. And uh, my brother Vince opens the door. My oldest brother, not even my dad, and he says, Mom's not going to make it through the night. We're getting ready to go to the hospital to say goodbye. And all of a sudden, all the guilt of not visiting her just hit me when I'm 13. We get to the hospital. All my older siblings are going in to say goodbye to her one at a time. And now all of them come out crying, and they're like, she looks scary. She's got these tubes, and, you know, everything looks terrifying. So it comes to my turn, and I couldn't do it. I didn't visit the woman I loved the most, and I didn't go in to say goodbye to the woman I loved the most. And she died with me not having seen her in a long time. And that bothered me and haunted me for 30 years, for 30 years. I had trouble processing those feelings. In fact, I wanted to forget them. I didn't ever want to think about them again. I was hoping to never revisit that moment ever again in my life. And then uh, years ago, my youngest boy is in eighth grade, same age I was, And I was almost about the exact same age as my mom. And I remember sitting, watching him perform in an eighth grade musical, and all of a sudden I start having my first panic attack. And I couldn't figure out what was going on. It got really bad. In fact, I had to take weeks off of work. Uh, I couldn't keep my hands from trembling. I was afraid. I literally, this sounds funny, but it's, I literally had to keep the windows rolled down in the car because I thought I was going to suffocate. It was such an incredible oppression of my mind and heart and feelings and soul, and I couldn't figure it out because I trust Jesus, I'm not afraid, all these things. And just all these feelings that I had pushed down about the guilt and the shame uh, and all these feelings that I had about that one particular instance was saying, we need to talk. We need to process this. And so eventually I remember going to counseling and that became the first thing we talked about. First thing we started processing. And I started learning how to be curious about my feelings instead of suppressing them. Started uh, being curious about them instead of just stuffing them down. And I remember after some time with a Christian counselor, And I got a bunch of counseling after that. I had to go through all this. But this particular instance just reminded me of me just trying to ignore my feelings instead of literally, and there's feelings that you can actually process by yourself. And then there's feelings I recommend that you process with a professional counselor because it's scary and it's tough. But the feelings are good. They're not your enemy. So I remember going into it with a counselor and after a while, they do some I know it sounds funny, but when I first started doing counseling, they're like, take these meditative audios. And I'm like, what kind of hippie BS is this? It's like, imagine you're, you're on an ocean. I'm like, this is some, oh, this feels good. What the, what's going on? Why is this working? Why is the soothingness in my voice and the rolling? I'm like, I'm like, I really hate this, but it really is helping. I don't know what's going on. But kind of stuff like that. And then another thing, they're like, hey, let's close our eyes And let's go back to that moment. That moment when you didn't open that door and go in that room. I want to tell you, uh, it's all imagination. It's all just picturing. But what it was really forcing me to do is deal with those feelings. And I remember just through some help and some process and just being there with someone else, even though it's just imaginary, I was able to open that door and see my mom in my mind, and the character of who she was, the thing I was afraid of, rang true. And even though, again, it was just imaginary, I got to hear her tell me like, oh, sweetie, I know how hard that was on you. You were just a boy, and you were afraid, and that was okay. That was the first time I had allowed myself permission to be afraid, that I wasn't a coward, that I was just a child. I was just scared. Even the idea of not visiting her, she's like, even the idea of that was just me being like, 
You were just a kid. You didn't know. Actually, nobody was telling me she was going to die. In fact, everybody was like, mom's going to be fine. Mom's going to be fine. Very Italian way. You know, just like everything's going to be fine. It's going to be fine. It's going to be fine. Okay, it's not going to be fine. You have five minutes. But that ability to actually feel all the feelings, literally to be curious about all that, I started realizing how much as a pastor that I was continually telling people not to feel the feelings, but just walk in the truth, walk in the light. They're not enemies. They're not against each other. In fact, it was truth that guided me and steadied me while I was feeling all the feelings. It was the truth that gave me courage that I could look at all this stuff. I can look inside. I can be afraid. I can, I can be scared. I can, I can have tough times. I can have panic attacks. I promise, I promise the moment I had a panic attack, I immediately felt shame. But I believe in Jesus. Why is this this way? How do I tell people? What are they going to think? I'm a pastor. It was the truth that there is therefore now no condemnation in Christ Jesus for those who are in Christ Jesus, that I could actually go into those feelings. I can go through anything with Christ and experience them. I think when Jesus weeps in this passage, it's giving us permission to feel all the feelings. You're not compromising the truth when you feel afraid. You're not compromising the truth when you're sad. You're not compromising the truth when you're angry. God gave these to you. And Jesus is exhibiting one of them right now. So uh, let's quickly go through this. Why don't you ask the first question? You want to uh, do the first one? Yeah, that's my favorite. <clears throat> my favorite one because it's so long. It's so long. It's going to be inside the, the Facebook. It's the question. Yeah, I will, I will post it uh, as soon as I read it. And then we have to close because it's so long. Yes. Uh, which of these best describes you? One, I do the right thing when it is easy. Two, I do the right thing even if it is challenging. Three, I pretty much always do the right thing no matter how hard it is. Four, I usually don't do the right thing. Five, I really like the movie Do the Right Thing. <laughs> I mean, I, I really explain. just wanted you to do this question for the gag. It's, I know. Just for the That's gag. That's the problem. That's it. Just You're the short on time, and he just, just wanted the gag. the gag. I wanted the gag question. I don't care. <laughs> I don't all right. care. I don't care. Uh, all right, you answer that. In the, go to Facebook. Uh, go to First Street Church Facebook page. Answer that in the comments. The question will be on there so you can see your, your options. All right, so we're going to pick up verse 17. Uh, Jesus comforts uh, the sisters of Lazarus. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now, Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem. And many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. A lot going on here. First of all, verse five says, Jesus loves Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. He loves them. This comparative in here is so harsh uh, when it says, now, uh, Many Jews had come to, like, other people are already doing it, Jesus. So if your excuse is, man, it's two miles. So the, the writer here, John's like, but other people had already walked there. It wasn't hard to do. And then two miles, by the way, um, is basically uh, 15 stadium. So basically, it's two miles. But I like, the only reason I'm telling you that, because that's their, their, their version of, uh, of measurement. It's like 15 stadiums. And the funniest part about that word is it's 600 Greek feet. How unique are the foot of a Greek person that, it, that it's, it's 600 <laughs> Greek feet is what a stadium is. All right, so not far, not far at all, two miles uh, to give you the ballpark what that's like. And uh, he, doesn't, he hasn't showed up yet. And here's the other part that I hear, rarely hear people mention. Martha runs out to see, goes out to see Jesus and Mary's like, I'm good. He didn't have time to come visit us. Why would I have time to go out to see him? There is a lot more emotion in this description. It's not just facts in this instance. The behavior, what wasn't done, says something. The, the length, the time, the four days. And I want to tell you, because I only have a little bit of time to go through this whole passage, I want to tell you what is significant in this to me. Jesus 
knows what he's going to do. But Mary and Martha don't. A lot of times we empathize with Mary and Martha for literally having to go through the process of watching their brother die when their friend, who loves them, has the ability to heal. They'd seen it over and over again. Not only does he not show up to heal the brother that he openly loves this family, he doesn't come until after he's dead and it's the fourth day. So, and he's only two miles away. So everybody is hurt in this scenario. And we always tend to go to their hurt. But the Lord led me to Jesus' hurt. He had to do the right thing when they didn't get it. That is hard to do. Doing right by the people you love when they don't get it is very, very hard to do. We think that Jesus is just walking up And all of a sudden, he sees the Jews crying, and he sees everybody else crying. He cries. I promise you, those four days were killing him because he knows what they're going through. I promise you, when he shows up and Mary doesn't come greet him, he knows why. And he's like, because she thinks I abandoned her, and I didn't. I go to what Jesus was going through. Doing the right thing when people don't get it is so hard. And I want to encourage you that that's the exact right thing to do, is to do the right thing even when people don't get it. And I understand and I empathize and God is with you in that emotion of that specifically. When I was in college, uh, I was going to school at Trinity. The church, my home church was Willow Creek, was a mega church. And when I first got saved, I wanted to work there really badly. I'm like, I really want to get a job there. Uh, They launched launched the first Generation X Church, that's how old I am, that Gen X churches were like, whoa, what's that? Called Axis. And my freshman year, uh, Todd Beasley, who was one of the main teachers at this huge church, meets with me about coming to work for Axis. And so we start talking, and I'm so excited to work for Axis that I'm literally like, I will quit school, I will go work for them, I will take this job, I'll do anything. And all of a sudden, Todd Beasley, who wanted to hire me, all of a sudden, in this moment, like, he just shifted in the interview from being really excited about me, like, no. He's like, um, I'm, I'm rescinding the offer. You need to stay where you're at. You need to finish school. You need, this is where God has you. And I was devastated. And now looking back, I am so thankful Being at school, I met my amazing wife. I have my amazing kids because Todd was willing to do the right thing when I didn't get it. Across from him, I'm literally a weeping mess. My dream job is right in front of me. And all of a sudden, because something like college, you know, he doesn't want to hire me. That's sarcastic. And he did the right thing. And I didn't get it. And I'm thankful that he did. That's where you want to be. I get it. I know that it's hard to be in the shoes of Mary and Martha, but I think this is a lesson for us to walk in the shoes of Jesus and do the right thing, even when people don't get it. All right, do we have any responses? I'll take one. I'll just take a couple. Let's do a couple. I'm getting the lightning through the rest of it. Uh, Lisa says, Lisa Huerta says, uh, number three, I always do the right thing. I like that. Um, She listens to Bobby Bones' podcast. Is that the right thing? (laughs) So which I can't up, really remember that name. It brings up a good question because then Emily Garrison was like, well, number six, what is the right thing? Like, I think it's, that, I think that not, was the best. It's not listening to your teacher's cult podcast, as you told us earlier in church. Hey. It's not that. Uh, <laughs> Mommy Carmi says, 3.5. I do the right thing, but because I grew up in a Latino household and feel guilty all the time, not because not I care about doing the right thing. <laughs> I actually really like yeah, that. I got you. That's... Um, Dana says I do the right thing uh, even when it's tough. And then I think, here, I will end with this one because I thought it was good. Uh, Diamond Crown says, I really like number five. I like the movie, Do I Do the Right Thing. But honestly, number one and two seems more accurate. Okay, good. Ask the last question. I probably won't get to it, but it should be good dialogue. Two or three. uh, Three? Let's do three. Okay. Yep. What is the most important question in the world? 
What is the most important question in the world? All right, you do that. I'm going to continue on here and just teach through this. I'm not going to be able to preach as much. I'll do a little more teaching so we can keep it moving. Uh, okay, so uh, Jesus said to her, uh, as Martha goes out to greet him, uh, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Don't one up, Jesus. This, if this is a game you don't want to get involved in. <laughs> This isn't, this isn't show the teacher you know what he's talking about. Has she not observed everybody who's like, I know what you're talking about, and then they don't. And so she's, she's like, right, but at the same time, the tone isn't, she's like, dang it, all the words are right, but the tone and the direction, that's what I got wrong. She's like, I know, he will rise again in the resurrection and at the last day. Pat on the back? No, no, not one of those, Okay. And then Jesus responds with to her, I am the resurrection and the life. One of the, my favorite I am statements of Jesus. And why the I am statements matter is if you've ever heard the term Yahweh, that's the Hebrew word for God in the Old Testament, it means I am. So every time Jesus emphatically states I am, I'm just like, yes, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. Uh, even though they die, and whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. Okay, so let me back up a little bit here. There's a couple things. One, uh, when she, basically, when, he, when she saw him, she said, Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died, but I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask for. I tell, oh, I want Martha's faith. I want to tell you as a pastor, I've walked into many rooms where people are very ill and the death and dying is, is right around the corner. Hopeless situations, marriages, children, you name it. And in those moments, I am able to muster at least a mustard seed of faith and I'm able to muster it and say like, okay, yes, Lord, this really seems bleak, but I'm able to, uh, dude is dead. And she's like, I know, God will give you whatever you ask for. I want dead man faith. I want to be like, because when they're dead, I typically tap out as a pastor. I don't walk into <laughs> rooms where people are dead and they're like, what do you think? What do I know? I know they're dead. Like, uh, that's, I'm, I'm out. I'm out. That's usually like, so Martha's like, no, that's cool. Game on. Jesus is here. I'm like, okay. I like this idea. Uh, but I want that. I want my faith to be so big. And here's what she believes. She doesn't just believe in who he is, God incarnate. She believes in how he feels about her. She believes in how he feels about Lazarus. She's not only convinced of Jesus' power, she's convinced of his love. And when you're so convinced that not only is God able, but that he thinks you're worth it, you are not dissuade when the when the event, the person, or the situation is absolutely dead in front of you. You're like, yeah, definitely dead. But I know he's able, and I know he loves me. And here's the crazy part, since we're talking about feelings. And the reason we don't step in those moments is we feel like if he doesn't answer the way we want, it compromises if he actually loves us. But it doesn't. You are not, if you risk and believe so big and the dead aren't raised, it's not a statement about you. It's a plan from him. It's not him making a statement about you. It's just, he's just saying, that's not my plan. That's not what's best for you. That's simple. I love we always talk about God's plan as if it's some cosmic, mystical thing you can't understand. The Bible makes it very clear. He's a dad, and he's just saying to you, that's not what's best for you, son or daughter. I'm going to do what's best for you. I love you. I don't want to give you things that will harm you. And in this situation, it is better that he's with me than with you. It's not a statement of a lack of love or your lack of faith. All right, so then it goes on, like I was saying. So he responds, I'm the resurrection and the life. Uh, he says, I'm the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord. She replied, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. Uh, probably the best question Jesus has asked uh, in the New Testament, it's the best, best question he asks. 
I don't get, when I, I just think about stuff like this, I feel like a lot of people are like, what's the meaning of life? I still see that in movies. It's like this, I, I don't know, I think that's the stupidest question. <laughs> what's the meaning of life? And I'm like, that is like the most lack of concrete type of a question. Like it's just, it's just so out there, can be answered in any different way. In some ways can be right, in some ways can be wrong, and it can be subjective or objective, all this. I'm like, that's, that's fine, but I really think, I really think, and I, and I could be totally wrong, I really think this is the question that people should be asking instead of what's the meaning of life. They should be hearing this question from Jesus, I am the resurrection and the life, the one who believes in me will live even though they die, and whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? I think this is the most important question in the world. And I think it's one that you should answer today if you haven't. And here's the best part. Even if you answer, no, I don't believe this. I think that's better than just wandering through life, never, never at least wrestling with this. I think you're better off if you come to a concrete no than a nothing. Never dealing with it. Too afraid to think about it. Too apathetic to wrestle with it. I think it's better for you to be like, either if you could say, I don't know, or no, I don't believe it. And then get on a journey. Why don't you believe it? Why don't you uh, not know? Why do you believe it? There's a bit from Louis C.K. Uh, where he basically says, you know, he's an atheist, and he tells this story, and he's like, he says, he, I'm going to mess it up, but it's great. But he, basically, the bottom line is, he goes, he talks about, I'm an atheist, I don't believe in God. And he goes, by the way, uh, I hope I'm right. He goes, because that's the real bad one to get wrong. <laughs> like, he's like, and even he says, atheist, like, this is the, well, he's like, I don't want to die and get there and then be like, oh my gosh, he's got the white beard and everything. He's wearing sandals. I mean, it's, it's everything they talked about. He's like, oh, oh no. And, and I agree with him in this. He's being funny, but anyway, like, of all things, forget getting it wrong, to not answer, to not take the time to answer. This is the most important question on earth. Now let's hear hilarious ones because I'm sure they are hilarious. Okay, oh, the question, uh, my question or this question? Oh. Okay, my wife wants to hear the Jesus question again. Oh. You have a Bible, but I will do this because I love you. <laughs> Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing me will never die. Do you believe this? You're welcome, my love. All right, what do we got? What is the most important question in the world? Uh, it starts with uh, Nick Portwood what? naturally saying, did you seriously ask that question with a philosopher in the room? Which, who is a, well, when a philosopher gets here, I'll worry about it later. I like this. Uh, Diamond Crown says, God, are you there? Which okay. I thought was very good. Yeah. Um, there, was, there was more debate about Nick than uh, anything else. <laughs> like the thread got consumed with uh, Nick. Colleen says, do you know Jesus as your Savior? There were a few of those. Jill Hansen says, how high? Don't ask why or how, just how high. Okay. Um, Snoop can answer that. <laughs> There's another, do you know Jesus as your personal Savior? Uh, well, Emily Garrison, again, she keeps just asking, what's the, right, uh, what's the next right thing to do? I don't think she's answering your questions anymore. I think yeah, she's genuinely just, asking just, for just, people's just, advice. Just, so maybe hop on there, everybody. She just keeps asking the question, have you taken I realized. Flow, Emily, I know you're, I know, have you taken flow yet? No? You took, no, so you didn't. So oh, you that's right. You were, at the, you were at the first you one. You keep asking the same question. You need to go to flow. That's right. We it, meant it, to kick you out of the church. We literally answered this question. Because you started flow and then left. I forgot. I you shouldn't feel be like, here. I feel like at this point, it's me listening to the Holy Spirit for you. Why don't we just teach you how to do that for yourself? That's right. A magic eight ball. Okay, I mean, that's cheaper than flow. Flow's like $1,000. That's true. <laughs> Actually, it's more expensive than flow. Um, one more. Because I just got to walk through this. Uh, all right, Nathan's for the win. Uh, what's the recipe to Chick-fil-A sauce? Oh. That's good. I like that. Uh, that would be important if Winco doesn't sell it now. Yeah, because they do. You just buy their sauce there. It's just mayonnaise. That's it. It just, they dyed it yellow. That's it. Uh, yellow dye number 19. All right, so let me, let me just wrap this up. Let me just go through the rest of this passage here. 
So she says, yes, Lord, I believe. And by the way, that if you have not solved that, that is the question to answer right now. No matter what your answer is, that's the beginning. Answer that question. After she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not entered the village, uh, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house, comforting her, noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. We always interpret that as a statement of fact. I'm not so sure it was just that. It might have been an accusation. They keep building up this idea that he could have come easily, and he didn't. Mary, Martha goes out to greet him. Mary doesn't. Maybe Martha's was a statement of professional faith. Mary's feels more like, you say you love me. You say you love my brother. If you'd have been here, he wouldn't have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him, he asked. So this... Embri ah oh my is the word here for moved in spirit and troubled. It's actually a negative connotation. We kind of take it as like he got weepy. He actually, it's more like he got pissed. And I, that took me down a cool road in my mind. All the way back to the garden, the fall, the separation. Almost like things didn't need this, almost like he was mad at Satan from all the way back to creation. He's like, this would never have happened if it weren't for that piece of crap. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I think, I, think, I think Jesus is mad at death and sin and suffering. I think we always think he's mad at us. I think he's mad. He's like, a, he's like me. When my kids used to get hurt, I'd get mad at them. Stop hurting yourself. I don't really like this. And they're like, or you could comfort me. Because <laughs> I'm like bleeding right now. Uh, that hand will grow back. But anyway, so... But it's more of a, it has more of an anger connotation, not a sadness in it. Where have you laid him, he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not the one who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Two things to end this with. Jesus knew he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead. Knew it. This is, this is the plan. And yet, he allowed himself to be angry, and he allowed himself to be sad. I don't know who sold us a bill of goods that I need to be strong for other people means that I need to suppress my emotions as a sign of strength. I promise you, you can march forward in truth feeling all the emotions. You can be just as committed to what you believe God is telling you to do, what God has done, to the resurrection and the life, to all things that are true and concrete and feel all the emotions on the way to being faithful to what you believe to be true. I genuinely feel like there's something, literally, the Bible says, do not sin in your anger, not don't get angry. Right? There's some wisdom practices with emotions. But I just want to go with Jesus literally knows the ending and is comfortable with being angry and sad. He knows the truth. Here's the other part. He's comfortable with sitting with other people in their emotions. In fact, he's the one that says, mourn with those who mourn, rejoice with those who rejoice. That he's comfortable not only with his own emotions, but with yours. Emotions are good. And then the last emotion that is here is identified... Um, by the people observing. They say, see how he loved them. Jesus' love for uh, Lazarus and Martha and Mary was so obvious that the people around could see it. I want to tell you, if Jesus were here right now, we would take note at how much he loves you. It'd be that obvious. That's cool. 
What's better is that's the same way you should make your love known to the people in your life. That your love for your spouse, for your kids, for your family, your friends should be so obvious that the people around you take note of it. That your love for God should be so obvious that the people around you take note of it. Emotions are good. Love is good. Jesus literally loves you. He is committed to the truth. He's feeling all the emotions himself and he's feeling all them with you. We can charge forward together in truth feeling all the feels. It's okay. Let's pray. God, you're amazing. Uh, Jesus, I thank you. Uh, just for these, these people here today, I don't need a long prayer. Uh, I would, God, I would just say this. Everybody sitting here, eyes closed, heads bowed. I think the most important thing to pray about here is if you haven't answered that one question, I'll even simplify it for you. I'll make the question even easier. Do you believe that Jesus is the resurrection and the life? And if you believe that, you will live even though you die. Do you believe that? With all eyes closed, all heads bowed, I'm going to ask everybody in this room, if you believe that, go ahead and raise your hand right now. And if you're not raising your hand, this is such a great opportunity for you. Say, well, why, why don't I believe that? Where am I at with this? And here's the best part is, we're excited to walk through that with you, no judgment. God, thank you for all the hands raised and all the hands not raised, for whatever reasons those are. God, bring them on a journey where they can really get comfortable with what they feel about you and what they know about you and what they believe about you. Bless everyone to that end. We thank you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. A couple things before you guys go, real quick. Um, uh, if you want to make a decision uh, to follow Christ today, there's a Connect card in the back. Just let us know. If you're new here, this is your first or second, third time, uh, fill out that card for us. We just want to get to know you. Nothing weird. We just go to coffee or something like that, hang out, just to get to know you. We, Floyd said it earlier in the service, we really want this place to be a family to connect. We want you to connect with us. We want to connect with welcome you. Welcome back. Welcome back. Or uh, welcome back doesn't work. You, no. think, you think they're here for this part. They're not here. Not the part they just went to. Depends on who was preaching. So the middle, yeah, not, the middle part was a placeholder to finally get this back to this part. This is what they've been We would encourage you to like, subscribe, and click that bell so you can get notifications about more of these sermons. Absolutely. We hope that something in that sermon improved your day, blessed your life in some way, and that drew you closer to God, helped you experience Jesus and live the abundant life. That's what we're all about. And if you would like to chat in any way, go to firststreetchurch.com. There is an I'm new tab. If you click that, you can leave us your information. We will call you. We will go have coffee with you. We will hang out. We will talk. We love investing in people and we just hope that this blesses your life. Yep. We're convinced you stuck around for this entire outro. So have a wonderful day. Yeah. If you, if you're still here, what are you doing? What has happened with it's you? It's time to go to your other videos. Yeah, go watch the next episode of You Won't Hate It. Why are you still on this video?